Ladies, mother and daughter, that was wonderful. All the music was really a blessing today. I hope your hearts have been blessed. And uh, as we go to the Word of God this morning, uh, we are going to be dealing with the subject of serving the Lord. Uh, Brother John Evans uh, brought the message last week, uh, Matthew chapter 6, talking about the importance of prayer. And again, this morning we're talking about service. So this morning, uh, as we embrace this subject, I'd encourage you to go to Matthew chapter 6, if you would. Brother John brought the message from Matthew chapter 6, dealing with prayer, and this morning I want to use this as a focal point for us today, dealing with service. Uh, It's an interesting uh, passage of scripture. It's all part of the Sermon of the Mount, which if you look back, begins in chapter 5. Jesus is talking about things that are very, very significant, and he's beginning to challenge the hearts and minds of people who have been pretty established, set in their ways for a very long time. And what Jesus is trying to do is he's trying to shape discipleship. He wants to make it very clear this is what discipleship looks like. So when you come to the Beatitudes, Jesus is challenging all the listeners. Uh, This is how you need to respond in this world. These are the things that need to take place in your heart and life. And even dealing with the subject of prayer, Jesus is challenging the audience there as to how to pray. And he is giving them some very significant help in this area. Remember with me that everything that Jesus is talking about is brand new to the audience. And what he's going to do here in chapter 6, beginning in verse 19, is he's going to challenge them with regard to the purpose overall for their very lives. And he makes this statement in verse 19, uh, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Stop storing up treasures on earth. And he gives the reason why. Let's look to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Lord, as we come to you this morning, we are just so mindful of what you have done for us. Help us, Lord, never to tire of the realization that our Savior, Jesus Christ, has made the ultimate sacrifice for us. And we pray, Lord, that we would now use our lives for his honor and glory. May we come to you, Lord, as humble servants. May our hearts be open to your leading. May we not be calloused. May we not be lukewarm. But help us, Father, to be passionate about our Savior and willing to follow you wherever you lead in our lives, I pray. And I ask this all in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. So you're here this morning, you've come to church, and maybe you're visiting with us here today, and you're expecting, oh, as you hear this, that the pastor's going to speak on service. (laughs) And you're thinking to yourself, go great, it's another message on filling the nursery workers list, and uh, trying to accomplish, you know, this, this, and this, and uh, browbeat the people to try to get them to somehow serve. Well, service in the life of the Christian has been... um, a topic that we've talked about for forever. I remember a letter that I received back in April of 1980. At that time, I was involved working for a police department, and I had the opportunity to, at this point in 1980, work on the police boat. Great job, I'm telling you. I was putting myself through college. My parents were not in a position to be able to help me. I had just left my best friend's uh, father's in, uh, business and come over to the police department because I got a raise from $2.35 an hour to $8 an hour. And that really helped when you're trying to put yourself through school. I also had a minimum hourly uh, time frame of 48 hours, which meant time and a half for at least eight hours every week. I worked six days a week for the police department. In the summertime, there was no exceptions to that rule. And so uh, the pastor decided that he would come to me, however, at Christmas time, and asked me if I would be the youth pastor for the summer at the church. And of course, my priority was that I would have to fund myself through college, and so we talked about it, and, and I was, to some degree, agreeable. Now, when you talk about service, 
And there's three points in the message here this morning. When we talk about serving the Lord, the key question in all of our minds is why should I serve the Lord? I mean, why, why should I do this, right? I mean, this is the main question. Uh, there's going to be a, a second point, which is what should I do? And a third point, when should I do it? But why is the main question? So this is the letter that I received from the pastor of the church. She said, the deacons agreed unanimously last evening to budget $500, that's $50 a week for 10 weeks for you this summer. I do not, he says, believe that that is as much as we talked about, (laughs) but it's all we can do. Will you be available for 10 weeks at $50 weekly, he says. The most that I can feel that I can ask you to work per week is 20 hours. Perhaps, he says, this will allow for you to pick up a decent second job. Now, here's the job description. Here's the duties. There really wasn't much to it. Have a weekly Friday night activity. That's weekly Friday night activity for the youth, operation, outreach, or otherwise. And if you outreach, uh, that was quite a big deal. Have a Sunday evening youth chapel after church every other week at least. You may have them weekly if you like. Spend eight hours per week visiting the young people and having one-on-one Bible studies with them. When there's no specific person to visit or contact, you'll be given door-to-door areas to cover to make up for the full eight hours. I would like you to have at least two hours per week in door-to-door visitation. In addition, he says, I want you to attend the senior high youth camp in June 23rd to the 28th. And then he puts in parentheses, you know, your way will be paid. Let me just tell you, in a 1968 van filled with kids, we traveled from Cape Cod, Massachusetts, through New York City to get to Camp Calvary. You should have seen that gauge on the dashboard of that thing pegged. It was 102 degrees in the shade that day, and I thought we'd never make it, but God was good. So tend the camp. Attend the boys' and girls' camp for fourth through sixth graders in August. Preach Sunday evenings twice per month and Wednesday nights as well. Preach a rest home service one Friday night per month. He says, I think that pretty well takes care of it. Hopefully you can get the 20 hours in with no problem. $50 a week. You know what I ask myself? Why? Why? Why would anyone with any semblance of reality in their mind want to do a job like that? $50 a week wouldn't feed my Camaro to get back and forth to the church. I mean, I'm serious. It, it just wouldn't. That thing was really thirsty. Well, I thought about it and I prayed about it and I said, yes. It was a wonderful summer. The opportunity to bear fruit was, was abundant. And working with the kids was a tremendous blessing. And I learned a lot. I was very busy that summer. When Jesus addresses the audience in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 19, he calls them to answer the question as to why. Why should you stop doing everything that you're doing and follow me? Remember, that was the challenge to the disciples. Come, leave your fishing boats and come and follow me. And Jesus' question and his challenge to them was met by those disciples saying, they immediately left their nets and followed Jesus. What compelled them to do that? What what registered in their mind so that they would say, yes, I will leave all of this behind and I will determine in my heart to follow Jesus. Matthew chapter 6, lay up treasures, Jesus says, in heaven. And he gives a, a reason for it. He gives the reason and he's basically saying, To answer the question of why, it's because it's the greatest investment that you can make. Jesus says the problem with these things that you store up on earth is that moth and rust comes and destroys. Thieves can break through and they can steal it all. 
You see, these things are not really very secure. All the treasures that we lay up on the earth can be done away with. Uh, the Solomon would say that, you know, money is like uh, able to sprout wings and fly away. And the point is that even if someone doesn't break into your house and steal your favorite whatever, the reality is that we leave all of these things that we do here on this earth behind when we go to our heavenly abode. You're here as a follower of Jesus Christ. You're going to answer the question, what am I going to do? Why would I be compelled to use my life to serve Jesus Christ? You see, the problem that we struggle with, the tension as it were, is we like to see things now. And we like to enjoy things now. And Jesus seems to always be teaching about the future. Look back with me in Genesis in chapter 25. I'd just like to point out the example of a man by the name of Esau. Now when you go to Genesis chapter 25, uh, you're basically dealing with a passage of scripture. Um, it's a busy time in the scriptures here in Genesis. We have the patriarchs. Um, when you think of the patriarchs, you think of Abraham and you think of Isaac, and then you think of Jacob. Uh, the latter, Jacob, has a brother, and his name is Esau. And the Bible tells us that they're very, very different. It, it, it's interesting because you, you know the whole scenario here, and uh, we have um, uh, a struggle at birth, as it were. And the Bible would prophesy that one uh, is going to the older, so shall serve the younger. And this is how this develops. In verse 22, it says, When the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the field. But Jacob was a peaceful man. He lived in tents. So there's a difference between the two in their personalities. And the Bible quickly points out that Isaac loved Esau because he had a taste for game. And because Esau was a hunter, he would bring his father good things to eat. Rebekah, on the other hand, she loved Jacob. And so you have favoritism in the family, and we won't go into all that this morning. But it came about that there was a time when Esau was out in the field, and the Bible says he was famished. And he came to his brother, and he said, let me have, please let me have a swallow of that red stuff there, for I'm famished. Therefore, his name was called Edom. Edom is the red stuff. But Jacob said, pretty savvy on his part, first he says, sell me your birthright. Esau said, behold, I'm about to die here. Uh, so of what use then is the birthright to me? And Jacob said, first, swear to me. So he swore to him and said, basically, I'm selling you my birthright. And Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank, rose up and went on his way. Thus, the Bible says, Esau despised his birthright. Uh, so you get it clear. It's an opportunity for the younger, Jacob, to be able uh, to pull one over on his brother. His brother's been out hunting. He is very, very hungry, and he thinks to himself, please give me something to eat. And his brother jumps to the opportunity and says, yeah, I'll, I'll give you something to eat. But uh, if you want something to eat, first of all, you're going to give me your birthright. Remember, God had made promises to the people of Israel. There was the Abrahamic covenant and the, the promises of the descendancies and so forth. And so the birthright was very, very significant. When you think of those patriarchs, you think of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. No, no. It's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It was a very big deal. But the Bible's very clear to point out that when it comes to Esau and how he views this birthright, he despised it. It was worthless to him. Instead, he would rather have lentil stew. Now, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't trade anything for lentil stew. My wife makes some kind of thing with, I don't know, beans and stuff. Ay, ay, ay. Maybe clam chowder, you know, the good New England with the cream and all that and some, yeah, you know, maybe we'd make a trade of something for that. But I am no way, I wouldn't trade 
Well, maybe I'd trade the dog for Lennel. But anyway, <laughs> the point is Esau is looking at what he can have right now. He is not looking at the future. And this is what Jesus is trying to convey as he begins to, to teach his disciples the rudimentary principle of following him, which is you need to lay up things in heaven that are going to last for eternity. Remember, Jesus isn't just saying that the moths are going to come in and eat a hole in your suit. The, the, the rust is going to come and rust your tools. Uh, you're going to have problems because thieves are going to break in and take it. The, don't miss the point. The point is everything we lay up for treasures here will be left behind. You follow me? And so in effect, the thief gets it. You say, no, they're not. I'm going to pass it down to my kids. First of all, your kids don't want your stuff. Number two, it doesn't really matter. They're going to leave it behind themselves as well. So, so none of those things matter. What really matters is what's up in heaven and what's laid up there throughout all eternity. That is your big key. Now take your Bible and go with me to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. It's here in this passage that the Apostle Paul continues the same theme, the same way of thinking, because he's going to challenge the followers of Jesus Christ as well. And he does it, and the wording here is a little bit different, but nonetheless, it calls us to recognize the significance here of using a life for Christ. Romans 12, 1, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. I like the King James, it says, which is your reasonable service. I, and I, you look at that word reasonable, and it means it's our rational service. In other words, what Jesus Christ has done for me gives to me the impetus to want to be a living sacrifice for him. All Jesus has done for you, make it very clear, is to go in your place and hang on a cross, die shedding his blood so that we might have forgiveness of sins. Is that enough for you? Jesus Christ, my friends, has done that for us, and so we're called upon now to present to the Lord a body for his service. God says, I want you to be useful to me, serving me. Notice here the essence of service there in verse 9. Paul writes here in, in Romans 12, and he says, let love be without hypocrisy. Uh, abhor what is evil. Cling to that which is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. That's service, isn't it? You give prefer, preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence. And then he says this, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. The word fervent means literally to boil over. You ever been cooking something on the stove and it's boiled over? It usually makes a loud noise, doesn't it? You come running. When something boils over, it means that the water can't be contained in the pot. It's going to come out. That's the passion that God's word tells us as Christians we need to have for him. We need to be fervent. We need to be boiling over in our passion for Christ. So that we would not think to ourselves, oh, my priority in life is to lay up treasures here. I'm much more convinced that laying up treasures in heaven is going to be more worthwhile. What will you do with it? I know you're thinking to yourself, Hmm, that's a good question. What would I do with it? And you're thinking to yourself, you know, the Apostle Paul lived his life for Christ. And he gives that whole litany of all the terrible things that happened to him. I mean, you'd think if you're living your life for Christ, your life would be full and free of any problems, right? I mean, it would be problem free, I'm serving Christ. We never have any trouble, right? Paul lists this thing, you know, well, I got run over by a tractor trailer. I was thrown out of an airplane at 500 feet. I was, you know, I mean, he goes through that whole thing, right? I mean, it's like just terrible stuff that happens to him. And you're thinking to yourself, hmm, he was serving Jesus and that's what happened to him. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to lay up treasures on earth that I can enjoy. 
because I know that when I die, I'm going to spend eternity in heaven. And so I'm going to just try to get both feet on either side. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of like, well, here's one side, here's the other side. I'm going to lay up treasures and I'm going to enjoy the daylights out of them here. But, you know, I've already got my ticket punched. I'll get to heaven. I'm going to tell you why in a little bit. That's not a good idea. What Jesus is telling the disciples is that wherever your treasures turn out to be is where your heart is. Notice back here in Matthew chapter 6. Jesus would say, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where nothing can be destroyed and nothing can be stolen And in verse 21 there of that passage, Jesus says, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. It tells a story. Where your treasure is, is is really where your heart is. And there's no getting around that. So all of us here can look into our own lives and, and be honest with ourselves and say, you know what? I think my treasure is, or my heart is set on X. This is what I'm living my life for. I'm living it for this. So let me ask you a question this morning. Where is your heart? What's important to you? Where are the priorities of your life? Where, where are the things that really matter to you? And it tells the story. In an auditorium like this, our hearts are in a lot of different places. Do you know what I mean? We've got things that we're really living for. God knows what you live for. And you know, I know what I live for. And it drives us, doesn't it? But where the treasure is, there's our heart. It's telling the story. Now, it's important for us when we stop and we we think about the the why, because we have to answer that question first and foremost. But what about the what? Think about the what in the sense that God has created for us opportunities to serve him. I'm back over there in Romans chapter 12. And there in Romans chapter 12, he's speaking about the, the gifts that God has given. Same passage that we were just in, verse uh, three says, for the Through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. So the first thing that that Paul wants to point out is that when it comes to serving the Lord and how we serve the Lord, God has taken the initiative in gifting the body of Christ in such a way It's not that we should think more highly of ourselves because we didn't gift ourselves. God has gifted us according to the measure of faith and according to his grace. God knows what he's doing, doesn't he? As we look at the body of Christ, there are, as it's pointed out, many members, but we're gifted so that the body of Christ will function all together. It's an important point. For he says here in this next verse, uh, for just as we have many members in one body, and all the members don't have the same function, so we who are many are the one, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another, since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Each of us is to exercise them according, accordingly. And so here we find that when you're talking about the what, this is very simple. It's a simple question that that we talk about here. God has gifted the individual members in the body uh, with grace, and, and he has given to us the ability to cause the body of Christ to function properly. And so it is in his wisdom and in his providence that he has done that. It's very important that the body understands how we're supposed to work together. Because if some of the members in the body who are gifted in a particular way don't function, the whole body suffers. 
Let's just say you start your car up on the way to go home this afternoon and you say to yourself, hmm, uh, you know, the, the starter engaged, that was good. Radio came on, that's always good. And then you sit there and you think to yourself, this is wonderful, the, the, the motor's running and this is great. And you put it in the gear and the transmission's working and that's great too. And you get down the road and you realize the air conditioner's taking the day off. And you sit there and you say to yourself, no, it's not all pro functioning properly now. We need the air conditioner to do its part. And we need the, the clutch to do its part. And we need the tires to do their part. And it all has to function together. And the same thing is true in the body of Christ. And when some of the members don't function, the body suffers. What are we supposed to do? Exercise the abilities that God has given to us so that we accomplish his purposes. The next question is when? When should we do this? And let me just read a couple of verses for you. John chapter 9 and verse 4, when Jesus is teaching, he says, we must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. And Jesus points this out. He says, the night's coming when no man can work. You can't work. There's an opportunity to serve the Lord, and it's a, an opportunity today. Now, the church is filled with good intentions. People, people are always having good intentions. Uh, yeah, you know, when, when life settles down, I'm going to start serving the Lord. Life will never settle down, will it? When you have extra time, the, the, I, I, you know, I know I'm going to have extra time. I talk to people who are retired. They tell me that they're busier retired than they were when they were working. And I'm thinking, wow, I mean, that's terrible. Don't retire. I mean, it's just, you know. It, it, but but it, seriously, we have great intentions. Someday I'm going to serve the Lord. Now, I understand that different times in life afford you different opportunities. You, you may be a mom, you might have 10 children, and you're, you're, you're trying to take care of them and raise them. That's your ministry. God has called you to do that. That's a very high priority, isn't it? You're serving Christ by working with your children. You see, all of us need to have a life that's passionate about Christ and focused on the Lord. It's going to take a lot of different uh, aspects. And so we want to be doing that, and we want to be doing it right now. One of the things that frustrates me, I can be honest with you, I get around a lot of Christians who tell me what they used to do. Oh, yeah, you know, 20 years ago I did this, and oh, yeah, I used to do this, I used to do that. It's like, let's, let, I have an idea. Let's build a brand new building, and we'll call it the Hall of Fame. You know what I'm saying? And you can get a plaque, and you can put up there, and you can list all the stuff you used to do. You say, well, why would you? No, of course we're not going to do that. But seriously, what are we doing for Christ today? That's the question. It's wonderful that you serve the Lord in the past, but what are you doing to serve him today? You see, we're called upon to serve the Lord Jesus Christ currently, right now, to our dying breath. And that's a huge point that we don't want to miss. And it's important because of that passage there in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, where the Bible says, according to the grace of God, which was given to me like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, Paul says, and another's building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it, for no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, he says in verse 12, if any man builds on the foundation gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, and straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it because it's to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work, the Bible says. And if any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he'll suffer loss, but... He himself will be saved, yet so as by fire. So let's go back to the thought process. Because I've never had anyone tell me this directly, but I know this is how many people are tempted to think. I'll lay up my treasures here because I know I have faith in Jesus Christ and I will go to heaven. 1 Corinthians, Paul is writing, and he says, all of your works are going to be put to a test. The fire will consume things that are done laying up treasures here on earth. The things that are done to lay up treasures in heaven will remain. 
Again, convince me why I should serve the Lord with all that that entails if I know I'm going to heaven. Convince me. The servants of the Lord seem to struggle at times. The servants of the Lord, their, their lives aren't perfect. The servants of the Lord, they have hardships. They have sickness. They have, they have issues. So, so why shouldn't I just build up my treasures here and then walk into the pearly gates? Maybe I'll, I'll walk in with, with uh, some great so-and-so who died the same moment who serve the Lord, but I have all my treasures. Well, the one thing you don't want to miss, and it's there in that passage, I just read it, was that those who lay up those treasures in heaven, the gold and silver and the precious stones, he says, remain. And those things which remain are indicative of future rewards that will be in heaven. You see, that's the one caveat that's missing, isn't it? And the Bible doesn't explain what those rewards are, but I can tell you this much. They last forever versus lentil stew. Many people are living for the lentil stew and not for eternity. And we have become so conditioned to live for the now, to grab everything we possibly can, we forfeit the future. I want you to know that you heard it here on this day. So if you decide that you're going to lay up treasures here on earth and walk through the pearly gates, you can do that. But understand, don't come crying to me when you get up to heaven and you got no rewards because everything was burned up and you're looking around at all these people that serve the Lord and you thought to yourself, oh, I wish somebody had told me to serve Jesus. You should serve Jesus. You should serve Jesus. And our service can be as significant as leaving Gambrels and going to the mission field or not. What does God have for us to do? Check this out. I guess it started one morning. I was sitting in church, uh, just a regular Sunday morning, and um, the pastor was talking about missions and long-term and commitment and all of these kinds of things. And I guess normally that would that would impact me a little bit, but this time it was, it was different somehow. It was like God was pounding on my chest and I just got this huge smile on my face and I was ready. I just started looking at my life and asking myself, what would it look like for me to be on mission all the time? and devote my life to that and become a missionary, I guess. I remember growing up in church that missionaries would come visit. I was just always captivated by their stories. And I knew that there was a, a world that was so much bigger than my backyard and that there were people in that world who needed to hear about Jesus. And I just, I've always wanted to get out there and have the ability to to tell people about Jesus and see that transform lives. I just kept hearing the same words, planting seeds, nurture, water, tend, person by person, life by life. Don't wait, you're ready, just go. And I felt like I was kind of waiting around, like is this something that God would call me into? And, and when would that happen? Where would I go? What would it look like? And then all of a sudden, it was like this lightning bolt. Like, there it is. There it is. It's, I mean, it seemed almost obvious. My name is Bradley Martin, and I am answering God's call to go, and I am a missionary.
Well, understanding that we are missional is an enormous victory. Living like we have a mission is huge for us as individuals. The church needs to be understanding that we're not here to just become equipped and never minister. We need to be equipped for ministry and then actually go out and do it. We have uh, a ministry fair today. You say, well, what is that? There's all kinds of tables out in the foyer and you can go out there and you can acquaint yourself with different ministries and some of the different things that are happening. And you can certainly sign up. We will take your ink any time of day um, because there are opportunities. Now, I just want to challenge us all, though. I think that we have some great ministries that are going on, but I don't feel that that's enough. I think that there are other opportunities as well that we, we need to take a fresh look at. Maybe some ideas that you have, maybe some thoughts for how can we uh, accomplish outreach here in the Gambrels Crofton area? What kind of things can we possibly do? Well, well certainly Christmas and Easter are big uh, opportunities where people tend to go to church. We want to maximize those things. Uh, we've been talking about in the future doing a living nativity. Maybe you have experience with that. I have none. I don't think I've ever even seen one other than on a video. Uh, but they are effective tools for sharing the truth about Jesus Christ. Uh, maybe you'd be interested in a softball team that has an evangelistic twist to it where we try to bring people from outside the church to come on the team and have the opportunity for evangelism. Maybe it's a senior adult ministry uh, that you feel uh, the Lord is leading you to, to be involved with. Uh, maybe it's serving the Lord and maybe it's on a, 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 a doing something as a deacon here at Faith Community Church. We have a need for deacons right now. In fact, in your packet of information, according to our new bylaws, you have the opportunity, if you're a member, to nominate someone uh, for deacon, and that nomination will come to the elder board, and the process uh, will continue on there. Maybe you'd open your heart to serving the Lord in that way. Uh, God wants to use all of us, and we're all gifted and given uh, opportunities to serve according to the grace of God. And so we want you to be involved in serving the Lord. We want you to be a member. There are certain things that you've got, you can do. You can join the missions team if you're a member, uh, but you have to be a member. And we want to make it as easy as possible to be a member here at Faith Community Church. You can actually go online. Yes, you can go to the discovery class and they'll help you understand it. But if you don't want to do that, you can go online and download our, our application for membership. Fill it out. Get, get it to us in the office. You can scan it and email it to me. And we'll follow up up with an interview and then we'll bring the results of that interview back to the elders and then we'll let the body know that you're a member so you don't have to stand up front anymore. That's like a deal of a lifetime. Um, well, we're going to put your picture up there. I got to tell you that. Some people are like, oh, my picture. But you can use one that's 10 years old. We're fine with that. <laughs> So, so we're, we want you, the most important thing is we understand the biblical requirements for membership is faith in Christ and Christ alone. You've been saved and then you've been baptized by immersion. And if you haven't been baptized by immersion, we've got just the place for that to happen, right? And so there, there should be nothing that keeps you from uh, coming alongside of the ministries here at Faith Community Church and becoming involved. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be out at a table in the back of this uh, auditorium and there are all kinds of blue pieces of paper that say ideas. And we challenged the first service and people gave me all kinds of ideas uh, for outreach and so forth. And so things that people are saying, well, I'd love to see us be able to do this. Or, and there's a lot of things that I don't even know exist. And, and maybe you've got a burden on your heart. I, I can't say that everything's going to be done, but we want to hear and we want to be able to look at these things freshly and be able to move forward. And so it's an opportunity for you to be able to, to say, hey, uh, here's an idea that I have, all right? And so you can meet me afterwards. Uh, I'll be back there and be more than pleased to talk to you uh, about some of these things that we might be able to be effective servants of Jesus Christ. Let's all stand, shall we?
And let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for saving us from our sin and the consequences of sin, which is hell. Oh, Lord, I pray that if there's someone here this morning that's not sure about where they're going to spend their eternity, that they would, they would make the choice to place their faith in Jesus Christ and in you alone, Lord, knowing then that they have had their sins forgiven. And God, we pray for those who are disciples of Jesus Christ, followers of the Most High. May you help us to see that the best thing that we can do is to lay up our treasures in heaven. May our heart be set on heaven, for that's where our treasures will be. May we be bubbling up, fervent in spirit, passionate about Christ, and may that truly be the driving force in our life. Give us, Lord, a vision for the future. Help us, Lord, to reach out and meet the heart needs of people in our own community, people who have yet to even hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. So bless, Lord, I pray, each one. May the days ahead that you give us the opportunity to serve you in be taken advantage of, I pray. And I ask it all in Christ's precious name, amen.